Gracious God, among the words now spoken, may your word be heard. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome back for those of you who've been away. Seeking joy is our theme this fall. I can't think of a better theme for us to pursue because the Bible makes it clear that God wants each of us to experience abundant life and joy. In the 10th chapter of John's Gospel, verse 10, Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. That's my favorite verse in the entire Bible. Christianity is all about making our life as rich and expansive and wonderful as possible. It is not about shackling us with 10,000 rules or burdening us with enormous sense of guilt. Whenever it verges in that direction, our faith is being misused. Now, the first Christian community in France was founded in what is now the city of Lyon. It goes back to the first century. When you visit that city, you can see two magnificent Roman arenas still in the center of it, and a great, incredible museum that traces the history all the way back thousands of years. In the second century, Lyon had a very insightful bishop. His name was Irenaeus, and he said, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. The glory of God is a human being fully alive. Joy is about becoming fully alive and living into abundant life. Today's gospel offers insights into a very key aspect of experiencing that abundant life. It's the first of two lessons back to back where Jesus teaches us about how to forgive. Without being able to forgive, we cannot experience the abundant life and joy that God desires for us. For we humans are riddled with anger, selfishness, jealousy, cruelty, and betrayal. For us, forgiveness is not a luxury, but a necessity if we are going to experience joy and abundant life. Can you think of a particular moment in time where you struggled very hard to forgive someone? If so, just raise your hand for a moment. If you've ever struggled to forgive someone, it's universal, universal. And the key question for each of us to ask ourselves is how much power do we want the past to play in our present? How much power do we want the past to play in our present? When someone has hurt us in a very bad way, we get stuck. We struggle to move forward. Every step seems to be hard to take. Let me give you an illustration. For the past decade, I've traveled to Spain to hike one of the Caminos to Santiago de Compostela each summer. There are hundreds of Caminos that stretch all the way through Europe and lead down to this holy city called Santiago de Compostela in the northwest corner of Spain. A number of you have been there. They believe that the body of St. James, Jesus' disciple, is buried there. And so pilgrims make a long journey to visit that holy site. Each year, over 300,000 people walk part of that journey. Now this year, I walked part of it that stretches from Le puy en velay in France down to Cahors, and it continues on for 1,000 miles all the way to Santiago de Compostela. I just walked part of that. Now many of us carry our own backpack as we make a journey like that. And so I strapped this thing on, and I want you to know that every extra pound you notice. And I am so stupid, I carry books in this. No other pilgrim does. I carry a veritable library to read, always with expectations that I will have more time 
to read than I imagine. And nothing is more fearful than, for me than to imagine arriving someplace and having nothing to read in way too much time. So this thing was packed to the gills. It's only supposed to be carry 10% of your body weight. And as I said, each extra pound hinders you, makes you move more slowly. It, it adds, you know, extra burden, and it takes away from the joy of the journey. Now, after 10 days of carrying this thing everywhere I went, my right shoulder started to hurt a great deal. So I contacted an agency that for nine euros a day would transport my bag from one lodging to the next. It was the best money I spent in a decade. And all of a sudden, I was walking more freely. I was walking faster. I was outpacing a lot of pilgrims. They had backpack less envy. But when you and I fail to forgive someone, it's as though we've stuck them in the backpack with us. And everywhere we go, we have to transport them. And they weigh us down. Sometimes they keep us from taking that next step. Everything becomes kind of a hindrance. And the joy of the journey disappears. But when you and I are able to forgive, it's as if we just drop this and say, I no longer need to carry this. Are you with me? I'm going to go free. And we set ourselves into a beautiful new experience. And that's why Jesus puts forgiveness at the center of everything that he taught. It's right there at the center of the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And when Jesus encountered someone who was injured or hurting, one of the things he most frequently said was, your sins are forgiven. It's as if he could see that they were carrying this huge burden, and he said, drop it. Leave it behind you. You're free to go without it. And that made all the difference. When you and I refuse to forgive someone or just can't bring ourselves to do that, it's like a dark cloud hovering over us at all times. And we don't experience the glory of God being a human being fully alive because we are denying to forgive someone. It's neither the joyful nor the abundant life that Jesus promises us. Now, much of history has been shaped about people's unwillingness to forgive others. Many scholars say that World War II would never have occurred had the Allies not been so vengeful towards Germany after defeating her in World War I. The Germans felt diminished and crippled, which created an environment where someone like Adolf Hitler could rise to power. The Israelis and Palestinians have been locked in an awful conflict for decades. The late Archbishop Desmond Tutu said that the plight of the Palestinians is worse than anything faced by blacks in apartheid South Africa. And both the Israelis and the Palestinians can tell you countless stories of atrocities and pain and injury. But until there can be forgiveness, there will be no future that is hopeful for these two groups. In our gospel today, excuse me, before I go further, let me just share a bit about what forgiveness is and is not. Forgiveness does not mean forgetting. Sometimes we cannot forget. And sometimes remembering helps us to protect ourselves from being hurt again. Forgiveness does not mean that everything's all right. 
because it's not all right. Nor does forgiveness depend on the other person saying that they are sorry. In many cases, the person who has injured us cannot see or is unwilling to acknowledge the hurt that has been inflicted upon us. We must forgive anyway for our own sake. Forgiveness doesn't mean that there shouldn't be punishment because people need to be held accountable. And this protects all of us in society. Forgiveness means that I may still be deeply angry with you, but I don't want to stay trapped in that. I don't want to stay trapped in my own anger and resentment, but I want to let go and move forward and acknowledge that both of us need to be forgiven by God. So I want to move forward with a clean slate and let God take care of the rest. The heart of forgiveness is this profound act of letting go. In Greek and Aramaic, the languages that Jesus spoke, to forgive means to let go, to release, and to surrender. And when we release that anger and surrender all that resentment that's built up within us, then God's love and peace can reclaim us in a beautiful way. In our gospel lesson today, Jesus gives us some clear steps. He said the first step is you got to go talk to the person face to face in a private, not a threatening way and share what's happened to you and how it's hurt you. So often we never take that step. We wait for the person to come to us and say, hey, I really messed up. And they often don't even realize what they've done to us. Or we talk to many people about how we've been hurt, but never to the person who has hurt us. Jesus said, if that doesn't work, then bring two or three other people with you. People who can acknowledge and back you up and testify how you've been hurt. There's leverage in numbers. And he said, if that doesn't work, and gather together some folks from your community, your school, your workplace, your neighborhood, wherever this happened, and have them join you in talking to this person. And if that doesn't work, he said, tell the community, tell the church, because we have to have boundaries about what is and is not acceptable in society and in life. And if none of that works, Jesus says, then you can cut off contact from that person. You can treat him or her as a Gentile or a tax collector because no one has the right to injure us physically, emotionally, or psychologically over and over again. Now, all of this sounds simple, but as you and I know, it can be so hard to do. And it can take so much time to get at that point where you can let go. Often what it's like is taking a little bit out of that backpack of resentment and pain and hurt at a time until gradually there's almost nothing left in it for you to transport. In her book, Plan B, Anne Lamott, a wonderful writer, describes the great struggles that she had to forgive her own mother. She said, I prayed often for my heart to soften to forgive her and love her for what she did give me, life, great values, lots of tennis lessons, and for doing the best that she could. Unfortunately, the best that she could was terrible. My heart remained hardened toward her. And so Lamar writes that for the first two years after her mother died, She kept her mother's ashes in her son's closet. And after two years, she was able to move them into a corner of the living room. It was a huge event in her life. Jesus knows that forgiveness takes a lot of time. 
Lamont writes, I don't think Jesus was rolling his eyes impatiently with me while mom was in the closet. I don't think much surprises him. This is how we make important changes. Barely, poorly, slowly. And still Jesus raises his fist in triumph. Tomorrow is the 22nd anniversary of 9-11. Many of us will gather at the Costco Memorial at 8.46 in the morning to acknowledge the 33 people with close connections to Greenwich who perished that day 22 years ago. We will remember and we shall not forget. But we will strive to release and let go so that we can move forward into the abundant life of joy that God promises each of us. The bitterness of hurt and pain can only be healed by the miracle of forgiveness. And when we bestow that incredible gift, a soul is set free and it is our own. Amen.